With LCG, we saw a very simple algorithm for generating pseudo-random numbers or sequences, specifically sequences of pseudo-random numbers. And we care about the length of that sequence. So a good pseudo-random number generator will generate a long sequence of different values. And then it repeats. The longer the sequence before it repeats is better. In this generator, the length of the sequence depends mainly on the modulus m. If you make m large, if you mod by a large number, then the answers can be between 0 and that large number minus 1. So the larger m, the larger the potential sequence. But it also depends on the values of the multiplier a and the increment c. And there's no, we're not going to go through any ways to say what's a, how to determine a good value of C and A. Some examples of good values are given here. If C is 0, A of 7 to the power of 5, people have done studies and find that's a, a reasonably good value of producing a large random sequence. We saw when we chose bad values, it's a bad random sequence. We saw 23, 24, 25 and so on. So those values are important. Another generator, Blum Blum Shub, three people who come up with this algorithm. We start with, we choose some large prime numbers, P and Q. Uh, let's not go through a detailed example, we've got one on the slide, but we choose to. Two, two prime numbers, they should be large if we want this to work well. And if we mod those numbers P and Q by 4, we should get 3, is the answer. And that's, that's what they come up with in, in the algorithm. Uh, that's what this statement says. P and Q are the same if we mod by 4, and they both equal 3. And then we calculate the multiplication of those two prime numbers. P times Q gives us N. And then choose another value, S, which is relatively prime to N. In the next topic, we're going to cover prime numbers, relatively prime, and different aspects of uh, number theory. What can we say briefly about relatively prime? The greatest common divisor of n and s is 1 in this case. So you cannot choose any value for s. It's related to the, it's not a prime number. Relatively prime is different than a prime number. it's related to the calculated value n. Um, I think we cannot go through that in, in, a, in a short way at the moment because we need a, a good 30 or 40 minutes to discuss prime numbers and relatively prime to, to cover that. For now, believe me that we can choose this value s if we know in fact p and q. So the user chooses p and q, there's a way to calculate both n and s from that. And then n and s are used in the algorithm to generate a sequence of, of bits. So you initialize the c or x0 to s squared mod n, and then you go through a loop. My, my indentation is not so good here. These are both inside the loop. So you go forever. So for i equals 1 to infinity, so you want to generate an infinite sequence of, of random bits, pseudo random bits. Take Take the previous value of x, x0 for example, square it, mod by n, and then you get some integer to get the binary value, to get a 0 or 1, simply mod by 2. If you mod by 2, you'll get 0 or 1 as an output. And then you go back and do it again. You do for, so that was for x1 is x0 squared mod n, x2 is x1 squared mod n, and we keep going. 
just a quick example of that, some pre-calculated values. So in this case, N and P and Q are 383 and 503. They are the two prime numbers. If you mod by 4, each of those numbers, you'll get an answer of 3. 383 mod 4 is 3. 503 mod 4 is 3. We can calculate N from that, and it's, there's a way to calculate S from those two numbers as well. Then we use these two numbers of 192649 and 101355 in our algorithm, where we take S squared mod N gives us X0, 20749. And then in our loop, we take this value, square it, mod by N, gives us 143135, then mod by 2, and it gives us 1. This mod by 2 simply, if this is an odd number, 1. If it's an even number, 0. That's just producing the bits. Whereas what this algorithm does is it produces a sequence of bits. So the first bit in the sequence is 1. Then we take this 143135, square it, mod by n, and the second value gives us a bit 1. And just keep going. And this is the sequence of bits that we produce. The first bit, the second bit, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, and we can keep going. Yeah. So the sequence of bits that are produced. And that's known, people have studied and, and believe that that gives a, a pseudo-random sequence of bits for as long as we want because it just keeps going. There's no end to that sequence. As long as we... Well, not true. There is an n, but in, in this case, uh, our values of p and q are, in fact, too small for practical use. By large prime numbers, we normally mean hundreds of bits in length. So this is a, a, a very small prime number. So p and q should be much larger for this to be secure. And if p and q are very large, when we multiply them together, n will be very large. And note, we mod by n. The larger n, the larger the possible values that we get in the answer. So we will not repeat if, uh, for a long time if n is very large. So just another example of a random number generator. And it's considered cryptographically secure in that it meets all the requirements of a pseudo-random number generator for the purpose of security. Some random, random numbers we generate Depending upon the application, we don't care so much about whether it's how close to random it is. That is, if I need a random number to choose which quiz to give each student, maybe I give random numbers to in the exam or in a quiz, so everyone gets a different number and therefore their answers in the quiz or exam will be different, then my random number generator doesn't have to be that good. If it's wrong and two people get the same number, not a big problem. But with security, for example, if I want to generate a key, then I want it to be truly or as close to truly random as possible. So some algorithms produce more randomness than others. And for security, we say something is, um, if it's suitable for security purposes, cryptographically secure which comes back to one of the requirements we mentioned back earlier. If you don't know the seed, it's hard to determine what the stream of bits will be. So if you know the algorithm, if someone knows that this algorithm was used, but they don't know the initial values that uh, the user chose, then they should it'd be hard to predict what the stream of bits will be. Okay. 
And there are many other random number generators. We'll briefly show one and then give some more examples. So there were two random number generators, algorithms. Another thing we can use to generate random numbers is our block ciphers. As we said, a cipher takes some structured plain text and should produce some random looking cipher text. A cipher, by definition, should produce random values as output. If it doesn't, it's not so good. So all of our ciphers that we've, we've covered can be used to produce random numbers or pseudo-random numbers. Here's an example where the encrypt operation is AES or DES or whatever block cipher we'd like to choose uh, and we can use different modes of operation to produce a sequence of bits as output. So the seed in this random number generator is some encryption key, so value of K combined with some initial value V that we choose. And you see in this case, this is counter mode. So it's our counter mode of operation where the input, let's say, is zero. We encrypt that, we get an output. And then using the same key, we encrypt one. We just increment the, the value here. We encrypt one, we get some output. We encrypt two, we get some output, and we just keep going. And the output, if our encryption cipher is, is good, the output should be pseudo-random. Because what we like in our ciphers is if we take some structured or known input, the output gives us some random value. And that's what our ciphers AES and DES do. So this is just applying counter mode, and we produce a sequence of random bits on the output. And we can do it using output feedback mode as similar where we take the output here and, and just keep feeding it into the, the, the encrypt operation. And so long as the key or the seed is secret, someone cannot determine what the sequence will be. Because if you don't know the key, then you don't know what sequence is going to be produced here. So you cannot predict what the sequence will be. So we can use our block ciphers to generate random numbers. What's the problem? Why would we sometimes not use block ciphers to generate random numbers? What's the answer? Why would we not use our block ciphers to generate random numbers? They produce cryptographically secure random numbers, but what's the problem? Compared to, say, the two examples we went through before. So the, the generator LCG, this equation, blum blum shub, was a bit more complex. Or take DES and just repeat the operations. Which one's easier to implement? If I ask you for the homework two, implement a random number generator, you would choose this one. It's one line of code or set up some variables and so on. Very easy to implement and generally much faster than the block ciphers. I ask you to implement DES and remember just with simplified DES there are all those steps, the S boxes, the permutations and so on, much more complex. So generally the block ciphers are slower because they're more complex, slower. So in terms of performance in terms of security, using block ciphers is, is satisfactory, but in terms of performance, if we care about how fast we can generate them, block ciphers uh, may be slower. There's some standards of how to generate random numbers, pseudo-random numbers. ANSI X917 is one standard. It simply combines triple deaths. Uh, so it takes a date and time as an input. So the current date and time on the computer it represents as a 64-bit value, a seed value, and a pair of 56-bit desk keys. And it uses triple desk. 
and this is the, the structure. EDE is triple DES. Remember, it's applying DES three times. Encrypt with DES, decrypt with DES, encrypt with DES. That's EDE. In fact, we use triple DES three times in here. Takes the date and time as a 64-bit value. We take some C, V, some initial value, some two keys to be used in this triple DES, and we produce R and V as outputs. We can follow what happens. The date and time is used as the key here. Uh, these two keys come. Uh, sorry, as the input here, to the plain text input, this is the ciphertext output. Plain text input, ciphertext output, plain text in, ciphertext out, and the inputs of the keys are these three, uh, K1 and K2. K1, K2, K1, K2, K1, K2. And we combine them with some XORs, and that's considered one way to generate a pseudo-random sequence of, of values some value R. So we keep doing that. So we, produce, we apply that once, we get R1, and we get the next value of the seed, V, and then we do it again. So we, this is our s random output, and then we take this and feed it into here using the same key and just keep going in a, a loop, applying these, these operations multiple times, and we'll get 64 bits out each time. So just a w one way to use the block ciphers combined together. The last thing we're going to go through is stream ciphers and look at the relationship between stream ciphers and random numbers. A stream cipher uses a pseudo-random number generator. The structure of a general stream cipher is that we have some plain text to encrypt. And we say we have a stream of plain text, let's say a continuous sequence of bits of plain text coming in. If it's, say, a voice application, as you talk, the software generates bits representing your voice. We have a key. We take the key, and that's the input or the seed to the pseudo random number generator. It's called a pseudo random byte generator in this case because if we take a byte of plain text, one byte at a time, eight bits, we generate a byte out here. And to get the ciphertext, we just apply the XOR operation. Take the random or pseudo random output, XOR it with the plain text, and you've got your ciphertext send the ciphertext across the network. And to decrypt, you use the same pseudo-random byte generator, the same key, and therefore you'll get the same output. Note that our pseudo-random number generators, if we apply the same input parameters, we'll get the same sequence as output. When we use, for example, these values, if the key is x0, all right, this was a bad one, but if x0 was 23, then the key is 23 here, and we're using LCG as the, the generator, then the key here is 23. The first value out at the in encryption side is 24. We XOR that with a plain text, we get ciphertext, and the first value out at the decryption side is also 24, because we've got the same input. So we're using the same algorithm, the same input, we'll get the same value of this lowercase k here. And we said last week, XOR. Plain text, XOR with lowercase k gives the ciphertext. And quite simply, you take that ciphertext and XOR with the same lowercase k, you'll get the original plain text. That's the property of exclusive all. So it's very easy to encrypt, just generate a sequence of random bytes, lowercase k here, and XOR with the plain text as it comes in, and then send. And decrypt is just an XOR. 
this lowercase k, the output of the generator, is called a key stream. So this is a key as the input, or the seed, and this is a key stream. In this example of LCG was not so good. We saw a better one. The last one we had, which was, what do we choose? A is 5, C was 0, and M was 32. And we chose X0, the seed, as, for example, 1. So uppercase K, in this case, is 1 as an example. And the lowercase k that's generated as an output, this is the lowercase k, we get our sequence, which the first value is 1, and then what was the answer? 5, uh, uh, five 25, 29. Seventeen, and so on. In fact, we get to back to five, and then we repeat one and five. So these are the values of lowercase k. So when I have a value of plain text, I XOR it with five. All right, I have to convert five to binary, XOR, and we get our ciphertext. Then the next byte of plain text, I XOR with the next value as the output here, and keep going as I have plain text. Of course, this, this sequence is not so good because it only has eight values. But if we have a large value of M and better values of A and C, we can get uh, close to a billion different values. So we can make this sequence much longer. And we just keep uh, encrypting our plaintext and generating values of K as we go. And the same is applied at the receiver when they decrypt. They use the same sequence because they use the same generator, the same parameters, the same x0. x0 is the uppercase k. And therefore, they'll get the same values of the lowercase k, the key stream as an output. They'll get 5, 25, 29, 17. And that will be used here. 5 xor with ciphertext. 25 XOR with ciphertext, and so on. And we'll get the original plain text back. So remember, these are pseudo-random number generators. If you apply the algorithm with the same parameters, you'll get the same sequence. You'll not get a different sequence. So generally with a random number generator, a pseudo-random number generator, when you use the same seed, you'll get the exact same sequence out. And that's what we use here. We, with the same seed, x0 equal to 1, we'll always get this sequence. So to use a pseudo-random number generator for a stream cipher, what do we need to be secure? The sequence here should be long, have a large period. So before it repeats, the, we should have many different values here. And in our example here, for example, m should be large, gives us a potentially larger period. So we talk about the period of the sequence, the number of values before it repeats. And the algorithm that we use here should be such that the key stream, this sequence here, is, appears random, approximate true uh, random number se stream or sequence. And the key, the seed, should not be able to be guessed. Because as with any cipher, the key should be secret. Because if, if the attacker knows the key, they intercept the cipher text. If they know the value of the key, they can generate the exact same sequence of numbers here. If they know x0 equals 1, the attacker will generate 5, 25, 29, 17, XOR with a ciphertext, and they'll get the plain text. So the key must be secret, and to keep it secret, it must be long enough to withstand a brute force attack. 
So say a 128 bit key. When we compare stream ciphers to block ciphers, they're usually simpler to implement and faster as a result. A stream cipher, we should not reuse keys with the same, uh, yeah, we should not reuse keys. And we'll give some examples of what goes wrong if we do. Whereas with block ciphers, we can reuse keys. Let's go through a stream cipher first and then uh, see some examples. The, ex the one we'll go through is RC4, which we've seen before is, was used in wireless LAN in the old WEP and is used in internet uh, data transfer. When I connected to the Google website using HTTPS, my browser used RC4, so it's commonly used. Let's go through how RC4 works. RC4 was an algorithm divided, designed by Ron Rivest. Back in 1987, it's used, as we've said already, in web browsing and, and in the past in wireless LANs. We'll see it's very simple. We'll go through the algorithm. And you see, compared to DES, for example, it's something you could implement uh, quite easily. It can use different size keys. So the length of the key can be between 8 and 2048 bits. So you can choose the key length depending upon your requirements. It should be large enough such that it can withstand brute force. But there are some limitations. There are some problems when you use RC4 incorrectly. And that was shown especially in, in wireless LANs. In WEP, it was shown that Although the algorithm is OK, but if it's used with a key and an initialization vector in the wrong way, it's very easy to break. So the, uh, the way that you choose the key is important with RC4. It's not so much the algorithm, it's how the keys are used. How does it work? Uh, Ron Revest, you'll see this num name come up uh, when we come in other topics. Anyone know wh what else he developed? Anyone can think of a cipher that we haven't mentioned, but you probably know the acronym, a three-letter acronym. We've we haven't mentioned it. AES. AES, no, not the ones we've seen. We've seen AES and DES. They're named after the algorithm, not the people. This one's named after the designer. There's another one you've probably heard of is RSA. Uh, we, we will cover it later, but RSA is another famous asymmetric cipher. And the R stands for reversed in this case, and the SA for two other guys. We have some parameters and some variables that are used in the algorithm. Uppercase K, unfortunately we have uppercase and lowercase K because we refer to the key and the key stream. The key is like the seed to our random number generator. The key stream is the output, the random stream of bits. So we operate in terms of bytes here. The key is between 1 and 256 bytes, so 8 and 2048 bits. We can choose the length. There are two important variables used or maintained in the operation called the state vector s, 256 bytes, and some temporary vector t, same length. And what we do is we generate a byte each time. We have a loop and we generate one random byte and then another random byte. This is our key stream. It's generated from the state vector. We have a state vector which we initialize to values 0 to 255. So it's a vector from has 256 elements. The first element is 0, the next one is 1, and the last one is 255. That's just a start. 
and T is a 256 element vector or a array and that's initialized to repeating values of the key. So if the key is 1, 2, 3, 4, then T will be 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, it fills out the 256 values. Then what we do is we, for the first operation, use the vector T and perform some initial permutation. Rearrange S. Permutate S. That's just in the initial step. And then there's another permutation of S. And from that, generate a key stream, K. That is, generate a random byte. And we continue to generate random bytes. So we repeat step three in that we rearrange S, generate a random byte, rearrange S, generate a random byte, and keep doing that. And those random bytes are then used to encrypt the plain text by XORing the plain text and that random byte. So the random byte is K. So the encryption is just an XOR, plain text XOR K. How do we get K? By applying some permutation on this state vector S. This is just the, the pseudocode to describe step one. Initialize S, initialize T. S is the first element is set to value 0, the second element to value 1, and so on. So S becomes 0, 1, 2, 3, up to 255. And T becomes the values of the key repeated by just modding by the key length. some graphical form of uh, S and, and T. So S is simply an array with values 0 up to 255. T is an array with the key repeated. Then there's the permutation, the initial permutation of S. We will go through these steps with an example, so let's just briefly mention them now. In some loop, for each value of i up to 255, calculate some value of j and then swap elements in s. So we rearrange elements in s. And then that's just done at the start, and then we generate the stream of random bytes. So for, in a while loop, calculate some indexes i and j, swap the elements, calculate another index t, and look up from s using that index t and find our key stream byte, lowercase k. And then to encrypt, take the plain text, xor with that lowercase k. Do this, so in this while loop we produce the next value of k and xor with the next value of the plain text, and so on. It may look, com may look complex on initial view, but I'm tr sure that you could implement this code in an easy homework, one or two hours, in, in your chosen programming language, because you see, here's the pseudocode. Right? We set some variables, some for loop with two uh, lines of code, another for loop for the initial permutation and swap elements in an array, easy, and then another a while loop. We continue while we have plain text following these steps of calculating an index, swapping elements, and looking up in an array. So in terms of implementation, this is very easy when you compare it, for example, to DES, or AES, or the other block ciphers. Let's go through an example. It takes some time, but it's worth going through to show how easy it is. I'll go through on the board because we need a lot of space. We're not going to go through the full RC4 algorithm. I've cut things down because in RC4 we have a 256 byte array 
and I cannot write down 256 values and rearrange them, so I've cut it down so it's much smaller. So a simplified version of RC4, just to demonstrate the, uh, the steps that it goes through, and to hopefully demonstrate the simplicity. I think you have this handout in your lecture notes. If not, it's so towards the end of this topic. Just check. It's on the website. Why did I not include it? I didn't seem to include any. No. The, the handout that I'm going to go through is on the website. Uh, I can put it in the copy center if needed because it's, it's quite detailed. Uh, it may be easier to watch than to copy down. We'll do some steps. But instead of dealing with 256 bytes, let's cut down to... So RC4 has an array of 256 elements and each element is 8 bits, that is 1 byte. We're going to cut it down so it's a bit simpler. Just an array of 8 elements and each is 3 bits. So instead of having to go through an iteration 256 times, we would need to go through 8 times. And instead of dealing with bytes, just for simplicity, let's deal with 3-bit values. So we have some plain text. And in we're going to operate in, in decimal, so 3-bit values. I've just made up the plain text. 1, 2, 2, and 2. Where well, these are 3 bit numbers, so this is 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. That's our plain text. That's what we want to encrypt, and we also need a key to encrypt. Chosen by the users. And in my case, one, two, three, and six. Again, they are three bit values. So, what we do is we use the key to generate the stream. And then to get the ciphertext, we take the stream and XOR with the plaintext. So the first thing we do is initialize the state vectors, S and T. So in the real RC4, S was 256 bytes, that is 256 elements of one byte each. In this case, S is going to be eight elements, each contains three bits. I'll write it as eight elements, each contains three bits, and we initialize it quite simply from the values from zero up to seven. In the real RC4 from zero up to 255. But in this simple example, S zero up to seven. Just an array with eight elements. And T, this other vector or array, is initialized with the key repeated. So 1, 2, 3, 6, 1, 2, 3, 6. It's the same length as S. So that's step one. Then step two is to rearrange S. Perform the initial permutation. So let's look at this for loop. And here in the for loop, 
Where we see 255, we need to replace with 7 in this case because we've swapped, we've cut things down in size. So for i equals 0 through to 7, we, let's say, let's try first. We will not go through all of them, but for i equals a 0, j is initialized as 0. So the new value of j, which is going to be an index, is the current value of j, which is 0. And there's my pointer. So we're going through this for loop. The first instance, j equals the current value of j, which is initially 0, plus the ith element of s, where i equals 0. plus the ith element of t. And all mod by what? Mod by 8 in this example. Let's make it. And at the end here, mod 8. So j plus the ith element of s plus the ith element of t. So we just look up i is 0, so it's in fact of this element. We, we index 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3, so on. So it becomes, what's j in the end? 1. 0 plus 0 plus 1, which is 1, mod 8 equals 1. And then we swap elements in the array S. That's what this swap function does. It takes the ith element and swaps it with the j element. So S is currently this. And what we do is swap SI, I is 0, with SJ, and we just calculated J to be 1. And then we get the new value of S. So swap the first two elements in this case. This is just the initial permutation of S. We're going to rearrange S. Originally it was 0 through to 7. We want to mix it up. Okay. That was for i equal to 0. And we end up with S equal to 1, 0, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. It's not mixed up much yet. It's just the first two elements. So we repeat where i equal to 1 and then do it for i equal to 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 in our example. Let's we'll just do one more iteration. simply recalculate j. It's the old value of j, which is 1. We calculated j as 1, so it's updated. Plus s i equals 1, s1 plus t1. Mod 8.
that was this, this line, j equals the old value of j, which we calculated in the previous iteration as 1, s1 one plus t1 mod 8. 1 plus s1, s1 is? Be careful of the index. The, our index starts at 0. s1 is 0. This is s0, 1, s7. Because we've updated s. So it becomes 1 plus 0 plus t1 plus 2. Oh, sorry, I removed t. But t is just a repetition of k. So 1 plus 0 plus 2 3 mod 8, easy. And perform a swap. Sorry, I've gone. And swap S1 with S3. Swap S1 with S3. See, we just calculated j to be 3, i is currently 1, so we swap element, element 1 with element 3 in s, so 0 and 3 values will be swapped. And you'll get 1, 3, 2, 0, 4, 5, 6, 7. Yes. Uh, yes. Sorry. This 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 swap should be indented. That's that's a good point. My is, is it the same in the next one? My indentation is not not good here. This swap should be indented. Indented. It's inside the for loop. So inside the for loop, we calculate j and then swap and then increment i and do it again. So both the n4 is after the swap. And we do it again up until i equal to 7. Okay. So this is the initial permutation. And you end up with, I have the answer, a rearrangement of s. Two, three, seven, four, 6.015. That's after we do that step. So I've skipped ahead for the, for the other values of i. That was step step two. Yeah. We do it that at the start. And now what we do is we use this value of s to generate values of the, the key string, the lowercase k. And once we get them, we simply XOR with the plain text. So in fact, what we will need is four iterations. Because we have four numbers in our plain text, we're going to generate in, uh, let's go forward, we're going to apply this stream generation. So we have a while loop, we just continue. In fact, for our case, because we have four numbers in the plain text, we need to apply this while loop four times. And at the output of each while loop, we'll get a lowercase k. We'll take that lowercase k and XOR it with p equal to 1. Then we'll do the while loop again and XOR the new value of k with p equal to 2. And then the new value of lowercase k with p equal to 2, and then again. So we do that while loop four times. Of course, our XOR, we can convert them into binary, and you can do the XOR. Let's just go through one iteration of the while loop, just to give it an example. So i and j are initially 0. We calculate new values, i equal to 
i plus 1, so we increment i. Where we see 256, you replace with 8 in this example. Because we, the real alg algorithm uses 256, but in our example we've reduced it down to 8 to keep it manageable. So i becomes 0 plus 1, 1. j becomes, I don't know why it's an uppercase j, it should be lowercase j. j becomes the old value of j, which is 0, it's been initialized to 0, plus s1. Mod 8. S1 is 3. S0, S1, S2. So 0 plus 3 mod 8 gives us 3. So we calculate the index i and j, then swap the values in S. Swap S1 and S3 in our current state vector. So we swap 3, the, the value 3, so we're swapping 1 with 3, so this value 3 with 4 will give us the new value of S. So we keep permutating S, the state vector. 2, 4, 7, 3, 6, 0, 1, 5. Calculate this new variable t, lowercase t here, another index we're going to use, by taking s1 and s3, add them together, that is 4 plus 3, we get 7, and mod by 8 in our case. So the operation we're doing is calculate lowercase t, s, so i equals 1, j equals 3, s1 plus s3, which is 4 plus 3 is 7, mod by, in our example, 8, not 256. So 7 mod 8, t becomes 7. And then lowercase k is s7. And S7, in our array here, is the last value, which is 5. That's our first random number. That's part of our key stream, our stream of random numbers. <coughs> to encrypt our plain text, we take that random number, 5, and XOR with our plain text value, 1. Let's convert them to, so now the encrypt process. We have f 5, uh, we have p equal to 1, lowercase k equal to 5 in binary, xor. And that's the first piece of ciphertext. P1, the first plain text value is 1 in decimal or 001 in binary, three bit values we're dealing with. Lowercase k is 5, we just determine that in the while loop, which is 101 in binary. XOR then, we get 100 or 4 in decimal which is our first piece of ciphertext. Then we do it again, that is we apply this while loop again, find the new value of i, note that we don't set them back to zero, we continue, we had i equal to one, j equal to three, so i becomes two, j becomes three plus s of two, swap the values in s, Calculate t, 
find the new value of lowercase k and x or that with 2. Do it again, x or with 2 and with 2. And we'll get four values of ciphertext. And we'll stop there for the example. I'll give you the, the final values. Uh, not, not important. What's important here is that notice how simple it is compared to, say, when we were through, went through simplified deaths. With simplified deaths, we, we had two rounds. All right? In the real deaths, there are 16 rounds we're dealing with 64 bits. And we had XOR operations. We had permutations, different permutations. We had S boxes. In the real desk, we have eight different S boxes which we substitute and get some value, and then we repeat it all again. This, we have essentially four loops or while loops. Calculate values, so add numbers and perform a modulus, very easy to perform. Swap values in an array, very easy to perform in, in software or hardware. And perform lookups, and then an XOR. So in terms of complexity, this is much easier than what we've seen or what you'll see in any of the block ciphers. Uh, just for your information, the output, the values of lowercase k that we get, we calculate four values. The first value was 5. The second value was, let's see if we can find it, 6. Third value was 0. And the fourth value was 1. We only needed four values for k, but we could keep going if we had more plain text. And we XORed that with our plain text. So this is lowercase k here. 1, 2, 2, 2. And we'll get ciphertext. 4, 4, 2, 3. So that's our ciphertext. This is our random st stream. This lowercase k is a stream of random numbers. So you can use RC4 as a random number generator. Even if you don't want to encrypt something, just apply this while loop. And these numbers, of course, you'll be having 8-bit numbers. These will be uh, a pseudo-random stream of values. And we simply XOR that pseudo random stream with a plain text. So, again, like with most of the ciphers we go through, you don't have to remember the algorithm. Uh, and I, I can't even think of an exam whether I've given you do a calculation because it takes a lot of time to calculate. But understand the complexity compared to the other ciphers. This one is much simpler to the block ciphers. And that's the, the goal of stream ciphers, to be simpler and faster to implement, but still provide security. Not considered breakable so long as the keys are used properly. There is there's a weakness in the, the algorithm if, if the keys uh, in many, many protocols, they use an initialization vector with a user chosen key. And there's a weakness if those initializa initialization vectors are too small. And that's what happens in WEP. Uh, can we give an example? I'll, I'll, come, I'll come up to an example. Let's summarize and go through an example. So. That finishes random numbers and our quick example of one stream cipher. There are others, but RC4 is quite popular. Uh, so up until now, we've gone through block ciphers, given some examples. AES is one of the most popular ones in use today. We've gone through random number generators, in particular pseudo-random number generators, because our computers cannot easily generate true random numbers. And 
we use those pseudo-random number generators normally in a stream cipher like RC4. RC4 is its own pseudo-random number generator. We also see later that random numbers are important in other parts of cryptography. The next topic, we're going to move, so we've done symmetric block ciphers and symmetric stream ciphers. Symmetric in that still both sides have the same key. RC4, both sides need the same key. DES, AES, both sides need the same key. The next topic is focusing towards asymmetric ciphers, where there are two different keys. One of them is public and one is secret. And we need to go through some mathematics to understand that. So the next topic's on number theory. But for the last 10 minutes today, let's finish with some examples. Uh, instead of the example on uh, WEP and uh, RC4, I think we'll go straight to the homework so you can do that. So the homework is described on, on this web page. You can see the description. What I'll do is give some quick examples uh, on the screen here. It looks complex, but you'll find once you understand what the commands are doing, and I give you most of the commands, there are, so you have to use them on the command line, uh, and we're using OpenSSL, which is uh, a program to do encryption using many different ciphers. It looks complex, but in the end you'll find that you need maybe 10 or 12 commands to do the ho entire homework. There's, from last year, we had a similar homework. Uh, different, some different questions, but using the same software. So I have some screencasts that you can check, and you'll see the commands in, in there. But let's do them now. Uh, quickly looking at OpenSSL. I want to encrypt some mes uh, a message. So first, I'm going to create a message. And you can use a text editor. But importantly, what we're going to do is we want to encrypt a message of a particular size. I'm going to use DES. And we know DES operates on 64-bit blocks. So for convenience, I want to produce a message which is a multiple of 64 bits. And in the first case, well, yeah, a multiple of 64 bits. Uh, so let's produce a message which is a multiple of 64 bits. And I need to find a message. I may have one back here. Here we go. So I'm going to use echo. All that echo does is writes to a file. Uh, well, writes to the screen, but I'm going to output into a file. So echo, the minus n option means don't add a new line. So I know the exact length. And I've just got some string here, and I've calculated before uh, the, the number of characters. And I'm going to put that string into the file called plaintext.txt. And if I look, plaintext.txt is 48 bytes. Okay, The length is 48 bit bytes which is a multiple of 64 bits, because 8 bytes is 64 bits. This is 6 blocks of 64 bits. And I want to encrypt that with deaths. Sometimes we'd like to look not just at the ASCII representation, but at the hexadecimal or binary. And one program to do that is XXD. And if we input a file name, it shows us the hexadecimal representation of that ASCII. Because the ASCII, each character is in ASCII is mapped to a 8-bit value, okay, a 1-byte value. And of course, we can represent that in binary or hexadecimal. Here are the hexadecimal values. So two digits here, 4, 8, corresponds to 1 byte. Because each hexadecimal digit is, one, is 4 bits. If you want it in binary, use the minus B option for binary. And it formats them in a number of columns. Uh, let's make 
Let's see if it fits on the screen. Eight columns. Doesn't fit so well. I'll try again. That's, I think it defaults to six. OK. So this is my ASCII text. This is the raw form in binary. So the first byte, 01001000, is in decimal, what is it, six, 72? Is that right? 72 in decimal. If you look in the ASCII table, 72 should correspond to the letter uppercase H. Okay? So the mapping using the ASCII table. I want to encrypt that 48 bytes of plain text using OpenSSL. OpenSSL does many things re regarding to security and uses many different ciphers and not just ciphers. Uh, one thing it can do is produce random numbers. We know with, if I'm to encrypt with DES, we're going to need a key. And we also need an initialization vector. I'm going to choose random values. And to produce a random number, we can use the RAND function with OpenSSL. And how long should the key be for DES? How long should the DES key be? 60. 64 what? 64 DES should be 64, 64 bits. bits or 8 bytes. So we pass. We want a random number which is eight bytes in length, and I want to produce it in hex as an output. And there's a random number, okay, in hexadecimal. And I'm going to produce another one, a different random number. Okay, so there's a way to produce random numbers using SS Open SSL. There are other ways as well, but that's one. And now we're going to use Open SSL to perform encryption. And this is the main command you need for your homework. Once you know this, the other steps are easy. And we say we're not producing a random number. We perform the operation for encryption. Okay? In fact, it covers block cipher encrypt and decrypt. We specify the cipher. I'm going to use DES. And we also should specify the mode of operation. For example, ECB, electronic code book. I want to encrypt. Let's give the minus E option. It's not needed because by default it encrypts. Minus E means encrypt. My input file is the plain text file I created before. And the output, I choose some name, ciphertext. Doesn't matter what you choose, dot E and C to mean it's encrypted. What else? When we encrypt with OpenSSL, we need two inputs. We need a key and an initialization vector and you can choose them. I think in the homework I say choose an initialization vector of, of all zeros. I'm going to choose a random one. And we specify in hexadecimal. And a key, uppercase K, and there's my random key I'm going to use. So that's the main way to encrypt with OpenSSL. We choose the cipher and the mode of operation. If we want to decrypt, we'd use a minus D here instead of encrypt. The input, in this case plain text, the output file name, because the, the cipher text will go into a file. We need an initialization vector. In your homework, you should use all zeros here. So everything's simple. But it doesn't have to be in general. And choose a random key. Now one more thing. OpenSSL adds some small, in fact, a one byte integrity check at the end of the ciphertext to check very simply if there are any errors. We don't want that because it, we haven't covered integrity checks yet. And if you, it may optionally add some padding. I know my message is an integer multiple of blocks, so I don't need padding. So you should use the no pad option. So say we don't want padding because I know my input is a multiple of 64 bits. I created it that way. And yours should be as well. And I encrypt. 
and we now have ciphertext.enc, which is a 48-byte file. That's our, that contains our ciphertext. And we can look at it using XXD, because it's binary. It, it's, if we looked at it in a text editor, it would not display very well. In binary form, let's look at the ciphertext. And there it is. So that's the ciphertext in this case if we encrypt using, what do we use? ECB. So remember with DES, we operate on 64-bit blocks. So here's 8 bits. 64 bits is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. The first block goes from here to here, 64 bits. And then with ECB, we take the next 64 bits of plain text and encrypt in the next block, which is here. And we have, in this case, six blocks, six by 64 bits. There's our ciphertext. So now you have the commands to encrypt. You can change these options, especially the mode of operation, different key and so on, different file names. You can display the binary using XXD minus B or even the hexadecimal form because some of the tasks need you to look at the binary form. Any questions? So the tasks in the homework, that's almost the first task done, except you need to select the plain text a little bit different. Then the subsequent tasks use different modes of operation. And one of them asks about the avalanche effect, which is now do it again, but with a different key. Remember, the avalanche effect says if we change an input by a small amount, we should change the output ciphertext by a large amount. I want you to measure that and see if it's true for DES. So change the input key by a small amount. A small amount is one bit. So choose a different key, which is different by this one by just one bit. Encrypt, and now compare the output from this one with the second one and see how many bits are different. And count them. Do it several times and look at the average. On average, how many bits differ when you change one bit in the key? And discuss that. So try the assignment. Do it by next lecture. We're out of time for today. Next week, we will start on the next topic, discuss a little bit about the assignment, and then prepare for the midterm exam.